introduce Christina Zella, and she's going to be talking about programming um, mobile games in Haskell hmm. and how to clean them. So, hi, I'm Christina. I'm working with Kira Studios, and there we are creating games written in Haskell running on Android, iOS, and desktop. And as you can see here, there's uh, several of our apps. The first one that I created was this one. And when I was asked to do this, I was told to use these libraries. So we have uh, already a bunch of libraries for games, for application. Please use them. They are helpful for you. And I was sitting there, okay, I tried to understand them. They were sparsely documented. There were sometimes signatures, which were very awesome abstract. And I didn't figure out what they did and how they would work with my game. I tried to figure out how I need to combine them with other functions that are in other libraries that I needed to use. And it was so hard. And I thought, come on, can I please write my own code? Because this is what I know, and then I can work with it. And I think many people have this feeling if they see some pa uh, packages from other people, and they think, uh, probably I write my own thing. And I'm a remote worker, which means if I want to know something from someone else, I need to write emails or I need to wait for the next meeting. So it's just a very, very long time that you get an answer. And I think many people have this feeling, ah, let's write our own stuff. But the problem with this is, if I start to do something on my own, then we have two packages. One package that I'm creating the other one that already was there. And then I need to maintain this one, probably my boss is maintaining this one, and we're splitting effects. And then a third person is coming in there, and it thinks, ah, I don't understand this one, I don't understand this one either, I'm creating my own stuff. And I need to maintain all of them, and if someone le leaves, then one of them go goes away. And I think that's a big problem. We're duplicating code. We um, probably make the same mistakes that already were fixed in another library. And that's only because our approach is probably a little bit better. But I think sometimes it's better just to make the effort getting one thing right, helping them to do it better, and to create one better thing. And so one thing that helps I think helps that um, makes this barrier to get into a library or in a package um, smaller and easier to overcome is cleaning. Because with cleaning, you um, make code easier, easier to understand, easier to apply, maybe even re more reliable because you know what's going on. Many people are using it, many people are helping you to fix bugs, so it's getting better and better and better. So I think cleaning is a very important thing. And I know we know about it, but I think there is basically, we know some methods, but there is not enough out there. And we probably could talk about it a little bit more and what we can do and how we can improve it and probably even which methods are still missing. So this talk is about what methods we are using, how we are using it, and the question then is open for you what methods are you using, and how can we make cleaning better and easier. So in our company, we have different zoom levels for cleaning. So we have different four key, which we are taking a look at. One is definitions. So I think you all know that you can take a function and just make it better and take a look whether you can document and stuff like this. This is one level. When we are done <coughs> doing this, then we are going a little bit out and taking a look at the whole module. So how is it structured? What is the imports? Stuff like this. Then we're taking a look across modules. And that's basically a cool thing for us because we are creating games. And I will show you how this really good works for us in our structure of game programming. And then we are also going out one more step across libraries and across applications, because games can have the same structure. And if you have the same structure for every game, then you can clean also between applications. So I want to start and go through all of them, 
The um, first two, I think there is more knowledge ar uh, around, so I will give you some hints, but then I leave you with the met methods that are there. And I think these two are probably less known, and there are not that many methods around, and there I want to take a focus. But let's begin. I have here a, a game for you. So I want to know from you what happens if you compile and run this code? but no. <laughs> Why not? We're missing one import. So the we're missing one argument. And therefore the function cannot be printed because it's still a function. You're more or less right for the next one. You already figured out it's 15. But you need one more argument here because the first argument here, the i, is not used. And there's a second implicit argument here that is used here, going into here, and the fmap gets the function and the list. But this is pretty hard to read, and if you couldn't read it, it's completely fine, because it's really hard to read. And I think that's not an exaggeration. We see code like this in our code bases and also when we're taking a look at other code bases. And that's a problem. So what can we do? The first thing that you can do is using GSC warnings. And one way to use them is putting them into the cover file. You just add we all, error, everything, there's different ways to do it. Choose the one you like. And then, what do you need to do? You need to compile it. And when we compile it, it looks like this. Hmm, you don't see anything. What happened here? Any idea? Kaval hides, hides the warnings. Right. Kaval, in the older version, hides the warnings. And if you don't want that they are rehired, you need the J minus, um, minus uh, J1. Because J is jobs. And in older version, it was by default using more than one um, kernel, if you had one, one core, that you, if you have one, and it did parallel, and then it hided warnings. So if you want to see your warnings, you needed to say, I don't want parallel, uh, parallel compilation. Nowadays, I think they fixed it, so the default is one, but in older versions, you need it. I also added touch, because if you recompile Sometimes you do not get all the warnings because the um, module was already compiled and it is not recompiled, and then you don't see the warnings. And if you do this, you see at least some warnings here. And you can argue whether you want to um, handle them or not, or whether they are useful or whether they make sense in your case. Because, uh, for example, my boss is using name shadowing, and sometimes it makes sense to use it. But if you don't want to handle them, please add the flag that you don't want to handle them. That's everyone knows that you have, have thought about it. And then it's fine. And otherwise, get rid of them. I recently co compiled some packages from Hackage, and I got a huge amount of warnings, and it's like, come on, I can't see my warnings if I see all the other warnings at the same time. So I really prefer to get rid of all of them. So this is one thing that you can do on function level. There are many, many other methods. Use a style guide. Take one and stick to it. Align your code. Alignment for us is very important. And for example, if you have do, not, do notation in Haskell, align the um, arrows at the same point. And if you do this, sometimes an, a bug pops out and you just see it that it's there. 
So alignment for us is very important. Document your code. If you see that something is really weird and it's hard to understand, drop a line. Then obviously, function documentation, module documentation. We are using head of documentation most of the time. I will show this later. The names of variables and functions should be nice and good and good to understand. Sometimes we start with a big name and then it bugs us and then we will change it until we find the right name. Sometimes we need some time to do it. In Haskell, very important, add signatures. As you have seen, we can have implicit arguments and is, if you see the signature, at least you have some idea of what's going on there. And you see something. The level of abstraction of a function is sometimes mixed. For example, if you have a game, you do something like sensor, then you update a game state, and then you're rendering it. And if you have a function like this, sense, update, render, then it's fine. But if you put the rendering, how you were doing it, in this function as well, so co uh, color this pic uh, pixel in red, then you're mixing um, what this function is doing. And that's a problem. So try to figure out uh, which level of abstraction you need for each function. We saw GSC warnings, and we are also using HDint. And I know there are many, many other things around, but I just added for the moment the things that we are most often are using. So let's go to the next level. Sometimes we're doing it one after another, but sometimes we're also mixing it. So we're taking now a look at the whole module. And there I want to make a stand for explicit imports. This is the same fu uh, function that we had before, but now with some fancy names of functions. And if I need to know what the, these are doing, I need to find them in these imports. And that's hard, because I need to search where they are. And if you add explicit imports, it's getting easier to know where you need to search. <coughs> I know that nowadays IDEs, some of them can figure it out and help you and give you some hints. But yeah, for, for the moment, for me, it's easier to have them up there so that I know what's going on. But that's not the only reason. Take a look at these two modules. So this is a game, game state, game finished, and there it's the rendering part, device output, and the logic part, which is the um, changing of the game state. We have two modules, and I will sh now show you two blocks of imports, and I want you to match which part of the imports fits to which module. So this is the first one. And this is the second one. Any idea? Which one probably is more render related? Second one looks more render. Right. So the second one has something like collage, display, background color, whatever. This is a name that needs to be changed, but right now it's there. But what you also see, there is something odd in this method. I think it's hard to see, but if you take a look here, you see a render environment. Why does the logic need to know something about a render environment? <coughs> and it shouldn't. We have a talk about this on Friday at farm, why it's there right now and why we want to get rid of it. But for the moment, for this talk, it's very important to say, okay, when we are taking a look at the modules and what we are importing, we know what this module is doing. So it's a good start if you see a new module and you see whether a module is doing probably different things that it shouldn't do. So it helps you to figure out what a module is doing, or probably if a module is doing too much. An example from me is, 
Um, when I started, I needed to take a look at other games. And with one module, I couldn't work. And I didn't know why. They were sitting there, well, this is so hard. I don't want to work with this module. And then I started to add the imports and make them explicit. And then I had a, li a list of over 15 lines of imports, and not just like this one, one import per module, but huge lines. And then it was clear to me, okay, I can't have all of this in my mind at the same time, while I need to think about this module and what this module is doing. So there was just too much around in this module. And we were, had an argument to say, okay, this needs to be splitted. We need to figure out what's going on in this module. So explicit imports helps a lot to figure out what's going on. What else do we do in the whole module? We are renaming functions. For example, if you have a bunch of functions that are more or less doing the same or are related to each other, we try to give them a name style that is related to one each other. We are restructuring where functions are, that they are all together, but we are also restructuring the um, order of the arguments, so that they always have the same, um, um, the same way that where you see it. So not that it's one time this way and the other one the other way around. If I have it the other way around, I need to think. If they're always the same, I, there is nothing to think, think about. It's just clear to do it like this. And it helps a lot for programming other stuff if I don't have to think about this kind of tiny problems. And we're using a lot of header documentation for doing this. And this I will show you in the next step. Because then we are also going across modules. And why is this possible for us? Um, I told you already we have something like sensing, updating, and rendering. That's basically what all game is about. And forget about sensing for a moment. Then we have updating and rendering. And logic is the updating, output is the rendering. We're doing this in the main, we're having it in the main function. And what we could figure out while we were cleaning, we created a cool structure which works pretty well for all of our applications. So what we are doing is the main function is calling the whole application. And the application knows about a menu and a game. And there, the application just says, okay, we are now in a menu state or we are in a game state. And if we are in a menu state, it, ju it just says, okay, sub-application menu, do what you have to do. And the menu says, okay, we're probably in the main menu. And the main menu says, okay, this button or this preference is pressed, I know how to handle this. It, if it does not know how to handle it, it goes to the menu and says, Oh, there was a button clicked, I should go to the level selection. I don't know how this works. So it goes up to the main, main structure of the menu here, and the menu says, yeah, I know how this works, you need to go here. If it does not know how to go on, for example, if the play button is clicked, then I'm going up to the application, and the application says, yeah, I know how to handle this, and says, okay, we need to go here. So the menu, is a sub-application that does not know anything about the game, and vice versa. And what you can see here is that the menu, this part, the application up here, and the game have all the same structure. They are just dispatching stuff. They know how to handle, yeah, here's a request where to go next. So these three modules, or well, module parts, are basically the same. They're doing the same thing. They're using the same functions. And down here, on the leaves, they are also doing the same thing. And therefore, we can try to clean on this level. And we were working hard to figure out this um, structure. Which means, I wonder whether you have projects or stuff where you also see something like this structure or where you assume that you probably have something like this. So think a little bit about it. And if you think there could be something around, then probably it helps for um, you as well to take a look at the head of documentation. 
So what you see here is Haddock. And what we are doing is we're giving it some documentation at the beginning. Then we have the functions. And we're doing this for all of our modules. And what you see here is we have the game loading state. The next one is the game finished state, the menu main state, and the menu level selection state. And if you take a look at these two, they're basically the same. The name is changing, and there's a precondition down here which is changing. And we force this to, to be the same structure. We really try to make them the same. So what we are doing is giving them the same name, making the arguments the same, trying to give them, them all the same order. And even if I don't need the preferences in this part, which could be that you only need it in the menu, but not here, you're just giving them there. And then we can ignore them, but if you need them later, they're already there. So going to the menu, you see there's one more function. It's not only anymore the game state. So here you have a game state. This will go to menu state. And there's down here a new function. And widget puzzles the error, which shouldn't be there. This is something that's wrong, and this needs to be changed. And going to level selection, you see there's just one more function coming up, and that's all. And that's something we are really sitting there with the head of documentation, switching and trying to make the same. What happens if you do not do this? This is the same for the logic. I know they are the same. They are doing the same thing. But that's jumping around. They do not have the same function names, so it's harder to see that the signatures are the same, and everything is jumping widely around. And we try to get rid of this, and that's basically how we are using head of documentation. When we're done with this, we try to use v minus d, it's from vim mode to diff mode, and this is hard to read, so don't try to read everything. I give you an instruction how to go through this module. So what you're seeing is this. I needed one year to really cover all the colors and stuff like this, so don't try. What you see up here, the loading is different. So lo loading is here, here it's finished. The imports are different because here is more stuff going on, but here, the black part, which does not have color, is the same. So this part here and this part is the same. And we try to make them the same. What can you do if you have um, parts in your code that are the same? So what would you do? Should extract them. Mm -hmm. Right. Extract them. Any other idea? So for extracting, you need to know how you can do it. So what is important for us is external imports and internal imports. External is something that we get from other libraries. Internal imports is everything that is from our application. And if we only have external imports, that's cool. Then we're putting it in a module that we are calling library extra, something like this. And this is a candidate that probably goes into a library because it's already fine enough that it can go away and if we need it in another application, we can just put it in a library that uses the same. Sometimes that's not possible because we have internal imports. Then the idea would be, okay, can we make it abstract? So for example, the game state, can we make it more abstract to use it in a library? Can we probably use type classes? Or probably we need to use templates. Sometimes we are right now thinking about, can we use templates because it's always the same structure, it's always rendering and display. And one thing that you see here is, probably you can't read, but here's the function complete visual. And this is a function that comes down here. So 
you can't get rid of it because there is a function that it comes here and this one is different. So what you could do is giving this function as argument, then you can get rid of it again, or you need to think, yeah, probably templates can, could help. So this is the way that we are trying to get rid of duplicated code. So across modules, we are also doing renaming and restructuring. We try to have the um, overall stuff that is used by many, many parts or many modules at the top and always the game specific part or module specific part at the bottom. So if you go to the documentation in Haddock, that the first part is always the same. You're using Haddock documentation, P minus D, diff RQ, which I will show you in the next step. Then we try to make it abstract. If we can, you're putting it in library extra or in libraries. And if this is not possible, we are using one shared module to put it for, for the time being there. And if it's used in more applications, we're putting it into templates, if possible. And yeah. Okay, so now we took a look across modules, but we can also take a look across libraries or applications. Again, head of documentation. These are two of our games. This is Impuzzled and Escape. And there are tiny, tiny differences here. Can you spot one? that we had, um, where we put stuff that is um, um, that we think that probably could go in the library. This game is younger and does not have so much stuff on its own, so it does not have this right now. Then we have app main, which is here, which is called here main. This is something we don't want. And I recently needed to rename this one due to compiling on iOS and Android. They didn't like that we used the word main for our module, so we needed to change. And the next step would be to update it here as well. Because we do not want to have different module names. Because if you want to write a script to update something in all of our games, it's easier if they have the same name, and you don't need to think about stuff. So that's the idea. And we can do this Again, here, this is main menu of the first game and the main menu of the other game. And what you can see here is these lines are all the same. Sometimes they're folded. Here, this is the one line that is different. This game has a background image. The other one does not have a background image yet. This game is just not developed right now. It does not have seen the designer, and therefore, there is no background image. And my designer told me recently I do need to align the buttons in a different way, so I updated it here, but not there. And that's the question how to go on here to update it automatically in the other game as well. Maybe the de uh, design of games will change, but we try to make them all the same. And if you use the standard names for a background, an ID that is always the same, it's basically only the image that changes. And if it has the same name in all of the games, you don't see any difference in the um, code as, at all. So this was the rendering part. This is the logic part. There are no differences. And that's exactly what we want. If I need to fix a bug in this module, I fix it once. And I can use the same solution for all of our uh, other games, and I even can copy this module in this one, and it will just work. And that's exactly where we want to go. So here you see our structure for the main menu, or for the menu system as, uh, at ho uh, as a whole. So you have the main menu, levels menu, about menu. It's always a dis device output, a logic, and some constants. And this is the dispatcher part. And if you take a look at the, this is M puzzles, this is one of our game, and the second method that we are using is um, diff RQ. 
DefRQ just shows us <laughs> modules that are different in both of our apps. And what you see here is the first one is main device output. This is the one that we saw. So the background is image is different and the button is different aligned. Okay, and when we are taking a look at this list, we are always thinking, does this need to be different? Does it make sense to be different in our games or could we make it the same? And here we know what is the different. We can make it the same, so it will be the same. You don't see the logic because the logic, logic is already the same. You saw that there were no differences. And we're going through all of them. And for, for example here you see the main state, the menu state, and this is something I don't want to have there. Why should be the menu state different in different games? Right now it's the case that mPuzzles uses some statistics. So was the level already played? How many points do you get for this level? And this is not yet in this game. But the next step would be, okay, make it the same. Put the dummy statistics in here just to have it the same. Just that I don't need to think about it. And it's really likely that we will add it there because we will need it in the other game as well. So just let it put it in there and not think about it anymore. So across applications, we rename, the restructuring, as I showed you. And sometimes this takes a really long time and you restructure, you do it again and again and again. We needed one or two months to figure out this whole sub-application structure, this picture, this big picture, um, to know how to do it in a compositional way. So this takes a long time. And we tried one version, it doesn't work. We tried another one, it doesn't, done, didn't work. And we try again. And someday we've just figured it out. This is working. Great. So we are using head of documentation, B minus D, diff RQ. We try to make everything abstract as far as we need it. And we're using libraries and templates. So what you are seeing here is many, 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 many methods that you can apply. And probably that's a little bit scary. So let me say you one thing. It's something that you need to do iteratively. So do it step by step, start. Sometimes a small difference can made and it already has a huge effect. Alignment, something that really easy you can apply in one hour and then it just helps you a lot. So iterative, step by step, go through. Next thing is talk to other people. Ask them what they think about your code. Take a look, probably they can tell you um, yeah, you reinvented something. Take this library. Maybe they have another view of your stuff and saying, okay, this doesn't make sense for me. Can we put it in the other module? Can we restructure it? So they can help you to figure out what other people need and how they understand stuff. And sometimes you can bring them to the point that they want to clean your stuff which helps you a lot, but sometimes also makes everything more dirty than it was before. So I had some point where there were more abstraction in there, but the functions were not documented. There were name shadowing, and I was just sitting there saying, oh my god, what happened here? That sounds cool what he did, but there is no documentation. So I cleaned again. Then functions were somewhere where I didn't expect them. So I figured out, okay, he didn't understand how I did it, but yeah, I don't understand how he is doing it. So now we need to figure out what is the best way that all of us are, can work with this module. So that's really important for us. And so that's how we are going through this stuff. So what do you think now? When is it worth to clean? So it's continually you need to clean, but what I say is, okay, if I'm writing a prototype and I know that nobody will see it ever, I don't clean. I just, in two months I will write, uh, 
throw it away. It doesn't matter. But the moment that someone else needs to go through my code, needs to understand it, I need to understand it later, then it's worth to go into cleaning and do something about this. How much effort does cleaning request? That really depends. You never can know. Sometimes the first time you do it, it works. Sometimes you need to do it again and figure out, oh, I did something. No, this is not working. We need to go back to the other state. What methods can be applied? You saw many of them. Hopefully you come back to me in the Q&A and tell me, yeah, we are doing also this, this and this. This would be pretty cool. How can you convince other desk cleaning is important? I really try to make this work in my talk, but it's really hard. So when I first thought about this talk, it was like, yeah, do something like before and after. And I tried. And what happened is, the only way where it really makes sense and where you see, really see this, wow, now it's really cleaner, it was a huge example. And I was sure, okay, I can't show this in 40 minutes. I'm not able to. So I think this is something you need to try out and then you see it and yeah, I really love to clean code and work afterwards with the clean code because it's like, oh, no, it's beautiful. Now I can implement something really, really fast. Oh, this is a one-liner. Okay, now I can go to the beach. Great. So. It's really hard to show it in a talk, but I think it's really important that you try it and then you see how, how much time you need at the beginning, but how much time you later don't need because it's already done. It's faster to maintain all this stuff. And now the last question, which I will leave for you. What is more fun than working with clean code? Thank you very much. of this part, then I'm not possible to make it abstract enough that this can be imported. So there I get into trouble and that's why we say, okay, if I have something like this, we try to use it in a shared module with internal imports. So if all of them are using them, then I would put here a module with, um, with share all the stuff. If these are using them and these are using them, I would put the shared module up here. And if I use it also in other applications, then I can only use templates or if it's possible, creating type classes. But right now we are not there, so we try to use for the moment templates to see already the shared part, but eventually, hopefully, we're getting into type classes that we really can make it the same. But sometimes it's hard to start with this, so. An intermediate step is, okay, put it there and try to use it with templates. Okay. So with templates, you mean templates have? No, okay. just um, putting um, modules that are, are the same. And we use some um, tools for Android and iOS. And they can give you, for to start, for example, an application, they can just give you a template that's already compiling and give you some basic structure, oh, okay. the main function, because the main function is always the same. You need to call the same modules and the same functions, but you need to do it in every application. So this is some skeleton that you can start with to write an application. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. okay. Uh, 
so, but uh, that uh, that sounds like it needs a, a lot of discipline or a lot of yeah, actually talking to people and so on this approach. But I saw it last. We also have multiple uh, mobile applications and actually having this not uh, not being able to actually have an external module outside uh, uh, made this difficult. On the other hand, uh, do you actually then try to keep up with the old uh, code because it also needs to be submitting stuff and so on? Is that something that you actually have some culture built up that you say, okay, now even if it doesn't change anything in the game, you actually put something out? Uh, yes, so we are really doing this. So we think it really helps us if in the future, in future comes on something up. So we know, for example, that we have one bug that um, the screen on some devices got blue and we still haven't figured it out but if we someday we will figure it out and if all the same uh, we, if we have all the same structure in all of our application you can just get it there and um, to make them the same um, the same state is easy because we're doing it in one and it's quickly done in all of the others because you are in this and they have have already the same structure so if you always go on and go on and go on and make them the same it helps you a lot to go on for the next time so yes we're really doing it but yes you need a lot of discipline to do it and nothing ah this is working right now let's 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 it's okay no we're really doing it So I understood you are doing this across all of your games. Mm -hmm. Do you see that there's a limit somewhere where you can say, oh, if you have 50 games, you can't keep that up anymore? Or do you think that can scale for the next years? Okay. We hope that we already found a cool structure that works for all of them. And then it scales. Because then you just build the new apps like the old apps. And I really would hope that it was also scales for 50 apps or 100 apps. But this is something we need to explore and see what's happening. So hopefully we will have 50 apps soon. Okay. Then thank you. Thank you. <laughs>